So good afternoon. Uh, let's start this uh, the afternoon session of the our meeting. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you Tobias Chuli. He's uh, Tobias is uh, working at the SRF for many years. Uh, he's now the head of the X-ray and probe group, and also the scientist in charge of the Beamline ID1. And uh, uh, so. Thank you for coming, and nice to see you here. Yeah, thank you very much, Helio, for, in, for inviting me. It is a, really a, a great pleasure for me to, to be here and to be back to Campinas after six years. Um, it is a, it had a very nice trip, I have to say. It makes things rather close, right? With overnight flight, I'm here. But fortunately, I didn't have to fly myself, otherwise I'd be more tired. Yeah, I, I'll try to... Uh, give you some impressions on um, how I see things on kind of recent developments and where we should go in terms of diffraction imaging or combining Bragg diffraction with imaging. And uh, I'll start with some introduction on nanoprobes in general. So first, those who know me or those who only know my name may not be surprised because my name couldn't be more Brazilian. Right? So uh, actually, yeah. There's only 159 Schuylli in Brazil, but still it's by far the first, so more than in all other countries in the world together, right? So this is, I'm, I'm speaking at home, and that's a great pleasure for me. <laughs> Whereas at the moment I'm working abroad, uh, the European Synchrotron, which is here in the French Alps, in, a, in this very, uh, this photo taken on an exceptionally beautiful day, it's not always like that, right? Um, yeah, and the, the European Synchrotron, the SRF, we went through an upgrade phase one uh, through which we built several beam lines, out of which ID1, where I'm in charge of. And uh, we are now in the phase two of the upgrade, where we are upgrading the ring to make one of these multiband Akramat super brilliant sources. Right? Actually, I've been uh, listening to uh, Harvey's seminar this morning. We know already how, uh, what a kind of leap that will be in terms of uh, source brilliance. And this will be operational in 2020. So the X-ray nanoprobe group, just very quickly, uh, we are five beam lines uh, doing partially mainly diffraction, partially mainly spectroscopy or other imaging techniques like nanotomography, but uh, uh, most of the beam lines are combining several techniques, right? They're just specialized in one direction and then taking the other for free uh, as much as possible. The uh, beam lines we are building, right? When you make conception of a new beam line or even more of a new source, right? Of course, we should always think, what, what metrology tools do we need, right? Because that's what we're building, metrology tools. Of course, it can start with a reflection where we don't need metrology tools. So typically, static systems and crystals, so systems in their equilibrium are well understood, right? So then experimental physics may not be so useful, at least investments are less well justified. But of course, as soon as we're looking at dynamic systems, right, far from equilibrium or metastable systems, then, well, transitions, some time resolution may be necessary, right? Or if systems are too complex, even if they're static, right? Well, life is never static, but if systems are too complex to be understood in a simple manner, then we need new imaging tools, right? We need 3D spatial resolution to image devices, for example, right? Or life, living cells, and of course, chemical processes like uh, catalysis, uh, process chemistry, batteries, there we need time and spatial resolution, and there we need new tools. So that's uh, uh, kind of a few clear directions or ideas we have to think about when we want to design new beam lines. So that's how I try to outline uh, the, the seminar here. I'll first give a kind of introduction into nanofocusing and uh, also uh, remind to everybody why is it complicated to nanofocus, right? X-rays. I will give some examples without trying to stuff in highlights here, just more examples that show most easily what those techniques can do. And then, of course, try to give an outlook on the new sources that we're all waiting for, right? So just nano-focusing, right? Uh, if you're using X-rays, I mean, X-ray light has been around for quite a while. And still, uh, we don't have X-ray microscopes like we have visible light microscopes, right? So it's not only a problem that we don't have the light, because we have the light. The problem is we don't have nice optics, right? So the refractive index uh, depends on the polarizability of a material, okay? So the electron clouds are polarized and they react with a certain eigenfrequency. 
And that brings us to a mechanical equivalent. Right? I've just taken it out of a, stolen it out of a textbook. So if we replace <coughs> the, the polarization by the amplitude here, which is the mechanical amplitude of a driven oscillator, then this is more or less our electrodynamic equation of motion. And well, we have an eigenfrequency here, then we have the driving frequency, which is the light frequency, and we have some friction, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're now looking for several cases, visible light in case of a large scan bed, scan bed, band gap, excuse me, uh, semiconductor or very good insulator, we're well below all excitation frequencies of electrons and polarization goes towards a constant value, right? That is very fortunate because it means we can make eyeglasses that work for all colors, right? It's, uh, it's achromatic and there is refraction. If we go to the other end and we say for the x-rays, we, we have not electron volts, we have tens of kilo electron volts. So we are way above, for most electrons, above all excitation frequencies. And then the polarization behaves like one over omega to the square, which means it goes very quickly towards zero, and it is very chromatic, okay? So we need monochromatic light if you want to use refractive optics, and the refraction will be zero. So that's, that's bad news, right? For, that's why there is no X-ray microscopes, and that's why we have to fight so hard to get reasonable optics. Of course, Optics have been around, but with all their drawbacks, right? we are far away from collecting light like we do for visible light. So there's mirrors, of course, that can focus and have reasonable efficiencies. The Kirkpatrick buys mirrors, right? Some of you may know better his daughter than the, so well, if you want to be famous, you better sing than, than working on X-ray optics, right? But <coughs> so these can focus, they can make nice images. There is refractive lenses, of course, with very tiny apertures because we need very strong curvature to get some refraction. And there is diffractive optics with all their advantages and drawbacks. So these are the optics that are around. The resolution, if you want to stay in realistic flux conditions and efficiencies and working distances, right, is hardly better than 50 nanometers. I mean, a factor of 10 can be negotiated here, right? But then you're, you're in the nanometer race where you don't make experiments, but you make small beams. So this is uh, something else. But we are far away from the wavelength limit here, right? So this is a, a kind of frustrating situation but we can work with it, right? So we can focus and get some spatial resolution, right, with a small spot. And then, of course, in the easiest manner, we, we, we scan it across the sample, right? And then we get some image. And from the sample, we recover whatever you want, right? Either diffraction, small angle scattering, why not, spectroscopic information, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're um, starting with a, uh, such a straightforward example, uh, recovering spectroscopic information. This is going to be my only example on the uh, inelastic scattering as I'm a uh, Bragg diffraction uh, person. <coughs> yeah, then we can, for example, look at heavy metals in living matter, right? That's a very, very interesting story. And for example, nanoparticles of silver, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide are massively used, right, in cosmetics and medicine and even in consumer products, right? But the first worry may be uh, their use, for example, in medicine, right? You apply silver nanoparticles to, to skin burns, for example, and uh, the Seraphic group took biopsies from a, from a person and checked where do the nanoparticles go, right, after, after treatment of the wound. And, well, of course, you can take cross-sections here and make uh, images, right? You can understand that's, that's relatively easy to do, and it's not a question of 50 nanometer resolution in such tissues. And the result is, even if it doesn't jump into the eye from these images, in this case, the nanoparticles, they don't go very deep, and our re the skin is renewed faster than the uh, propagation of the silver in the body. In addition, we can take spectroscopic information and look at the corrosion of the silver in the body, right? Whether it remains silver or which, wh whatever happens to the silver. <coughs> okay, so that is no dramatic result here. But then, of course, all these... Uh, metals and semiconductor nanoparticles are massively used even in washing powders and, and well, they end up usually in the wastewater, right? And then there's a whole question to be asked, uh, what is going to become out of them right, once in the wastewater? Because in Europe, uh, usually the sludge, where most of these are retained in the end, right, is used on the, uh, as fertilizer in agriculture. So that means the silver nanoparticles, they end in the sludge used in agriculture. And uh, we have another nice project here where people then studied the uptake of these nanoparticles 
in food crops, right? Just by making uh, sections, looking at, at roots, looking at leaves, and looking at the fruit to track these nanoparticles in nature. So that's a, uh, definitely a very important topic, the environmental impact of uh, use of nanoparticles. Going back to a diffraction, right? I've uh, been telling you before that diffraction is eventually one of the uh, uh, most important applications also of the new sources, especially if you can drive spatial resolution beyond the optics limit. Well, X-ray imaging and Bragg diffraction are very old applications, right? Usually, they're not connected to each other, as especially in diffraction, the angular resolution you want is used to trade in the uh, spatial resolution. But not everybody's satisfied with reciprocal space only, especially if we have had a very heterogeneous samples and complex samples that may require imaging tools and the information from Bragg diffraction. So let's think about a, a simple experiment. If you don't want to push to the nano limit, we have a flat two-dimensional powder. Of course, here focusing has its limits because if you have a 50 nanometer beam, there is no powder anymore, right? But let's suppose a painting here, so a cultural heritage object, object where in a painting, a few micrometer resolution is, is, is fine, that's perfectly fine. And then we scan such a painting here, recover the powder diffraction, and then in every point we get such a powder spectrum and we can then automatically fit these spectra and uh, trace a map of the prominence of different compounds in, 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 this, in this painting, right? Like that, we can show, well, we can look at what, what colors, what, what was eventually the original color if it has been changed, right? If we find uh, uh, out which chemistry uh, and, and compounds are, are in such a, in the paint today. So this is a, let's say, most simple approach for, for scanning diffraction. If we have uh, more monocrystalline samples or we, uh, we want to have smaller beams, well, then we have to think about a slightly adapted version of this technique. And for that, the Beam 991 has been built. So to make Bragg diffraction compatible with imaging, of course, uh, again, the simplest approach is we focus, we orient the sample beyond Bragg diffraction conditions, and then we scan in the beam, and then we get such images here. Right? This is typically used for microelectronic devices. That's the example here, a short circuit, small circuit board on the beam line shows at the same time that we need only little sample preparation, right? We can do the same thing under full field conditions. In that case, we condense the beam on the sample, so we illuminate the whole region of interest. We diffract, and in the diffracted beam, we put our lenses, our optics, and we project an image on a camera. That means we make a 2D image in one shot, and the contrast is done a little bit like in topography, right, by diffraction. It's like lens-enhanced topography that works in the far field, which has some advantages, especially if you speak about thin films or samples that typically cannot be used in, in, in the near-field topography. And the third technique, highest resolution and in 3D, is the coherent reconstruction, right? Coherent diffraction imaging under bright conditions. So this is the most advanced uh, technique and eventually still requires uh, most of the development. So nano diffraction, just starting with examples, we call that K-mapping, comes from quick mapping, right? Uh, what do we do? We focus a beam on the sample, we collect the diffracted intensity in an area detector, and then we scan the sample in the beam, right? Uh, much faster than we see here. And of course, the beam, the diffracted signal will move on the area detector, and then at the same time, or after such a scan, well, we, we repeat the same thing for a couple of angles, right? So we make a kind of sequential rocking scan, which means in every point in real, in real space here, we get a 3D reciprocal space map. So this uh, can be done for uh, any sample in principle, as long as we can orient it. So that looks a little bit more like a, in real time. So typically we take a few hundred or a hundred, hundred images per second is a typical speed here, right? <coughs> Hopefully a bit faster in the future. If we get the detectors, well, in principle we have them. And um, so then this is kind of a real space image here. Uh, we get a detector image. And of course, if we do that for a couple of angles, we get in every point such a reciprocal space image here, right? So we have a, a software now, which is very important, right, to have the right software to look at such data, because we're quickly speaking about terabytes, right? You have to have some idea how to visualize them. So in every point of the sample now, we can look at the reciprocal space, 
and uh, for example, select a region in reciprocal space that you want to fit. Right, to, this is all an integral part of the data treatment. So the software, just to give you this example, right before it took us a, uh, some while to, to, to get it, to develop it, a few years, and it's absolutely essential to carry out such experiments. Right? If the users during the experiment can already look at their data, and if you take five-dimensional data, then of course you need to look at them in a, with, with some help from a computer. Right? Five dimensions, why? Because we make a rocking scan, that's one dimension, we have a 2D detector, that's the second and the third dimension, that's the reciprocal space, right? And we have two dimensions in real space where we scan. And then we can look at the real space distribution of intensity, click on a point, and look at the distribution in reciprocal space, set a small box, and fit that region all over real space, right? So in case we want to look at only one phase in our sample, we can fit only that one and look at its prominence. So this is now routinely used. It's, a, it's really a routine technique for non-expert users on, on ID1 now. And um, the example here I'm, I'm showing is a th strain in, a sil in silicon around a through silicon wire. A through silicon wire is, a, a here in this case, a vertical copper uh, um, conductor in the silicon. So it's, we're looking on a conductor here, which is uh, which a cross-section of about 10 micrometers. And we're looking at the strain around in the silicon at 25 and at 400 degree, right? So we see kind of inversion of the strain pattern here. It's because of the differential thermal expansion between copper and, and, uh, and silicon. So that's a very uh, common problem in microelectronics. And if you can make strain imaging at uh, high temperatures, that's a very useful tool for, uh, for device makers. Um, showing this example, which, was, which is a very old example, which is one of the first strain maps we've taken, but it's still very, uh, impressive in terms of it shows best the resolution we have. So that's the ESRF logo etched into silicon, and then we're just looking uh, at the 3D reciprocal space map here and fit it in every point. And then of course, we can plot either the strain, which is plotted here, or the tilt, because once we fit the endpoint of the reciprocal space vector in every pixel, we can just uh, discriminate between variation in length, that's the strain, or variation in orientation or precession of the lattice vector, and that is lattice tilt. And what is very nice here is that the, you can read the ESRF logo, right? And um, we, did, we can easily determine here that the maximum difference between blue and red is something like 10 to the 5, 10 to the minus 5, excuse me. So a few 10 to the minus 6 variations in lattice parameter trace a landscape, right? That's something like a, a I wouldn't have dared to announce that as possibility, but as we can see, it, yes, it's just that your the, the, the resolution of the of the instrument is much worse, right? But if you have a, a, a Gaussian and you move it by one percent to the left and to the right, you can fit that that uh, uh, displacement very very reliably. And this is now used, yeah, fairly routinely, essentially on device structures, uh, everything that's kind of a more or less monocrystal or at least textured can be used in, in that tool. Uh, a nice example here, that's a gallium nitride layer grown on sapphire. I mean, gallium nitride is a very, very promising semiconductor. It's basically in, uh, in all the LEDs, right, and, uh, but has much, much more potential. And uh, one problem is to get a good substrate, and so people try to grow gallium nitride on something else uh, to get something nice to start with. And so there's all kind of tricks people do, like for example, pre-structuring the sapphire. So this is pre-structured sapphire and then they grow gallium nitride on it. And that's just a TM cross-section or just a cleaved sample in that case. And we diffract that then from, from that edge here, right? And um, of course you can look at the intensity, which just shows you where is gallium nitride and where isn't, right? Of course, here's the surface and here's the pyramids from the sapphire, and here's the gallium nitride. But much more interesting is of course to look at the, the strain variance, right? You get extremes at uh, these pyramids because the gallium nitride nucleates here, right? And then coalesces in the middle. So you get extremes at the nucleation points and at the coalescence points of strain. And of course, you can look at the lattice rotation as well, which has also extremes at the nucleation and at the coalescence points. There's no other method actually that, that could measure that, which is quite nice. And uh, we can then just see whether at the surface, of course, the growers hope that at the surface everything is homogeneous again and you no longer see that periodicity. Well, it, it, it's, Im it's impressively nice, but there's still some, some structure there. So that's a, a, a quite standard characterization tool now for, for such structures. And, and taking such a map 
uh, takes maybe an hour, right, with all the information in. So I'm moving on to the, to the next tool, which is more recent. We have opened it to users only since April 2017, which is the full field diffraction microscope. That means you come in with your x-rays, you condense them, you don't nanofocus them, but you make something like a 200 micrometer beam on your sample. You go under diffraction conditions and you put your lens or your objective in the diffracted beam and then you magnify uh, the diffracted signal from your sample. You image the diffracted signal from your sample on the camera, right? So that needs long detector distances in order to get nice resolution here. And the long detector arm that can rotate in the horizontal around the sample. Here we've been using SU8 lenses, which is made out of photoresist, so uh, polymer lenses that make very nice images. And typical application, as I said, we opened this in, in April, so there's not a, a massive results out yet. Uh, if you look on a, uh, the lithiation of a silicon electrode in a battery, right? So uh, silicon is a promising electrode material for lithium ion batteries. And the nice thing of this tool here is we can make 2D images without moving anything, okay? So we, can't, we don't take here all of reciprocal space. We are sitting in one point in reciprocal space and we see how it's evolving in real space during a certain process that we want to follow. So that's a very typical application of such a tool. And of course we built our own battery to, to, to have a monocrystalline silicon electrode here. Resolution today is 100, 200 nanometers, uh, limited by the optics, of course. Uh, that is also used for uh, first operando synthesis of uh, thin films. Here, this is a metal organic solar cell, a methyl ammonium solar cell, uh, where people deposited it and then did some solvent annealing. And what we're looking at here is one prominent out-of-plane orientation of the crystallites and how that uh, changes during the production, during the process. Because the stability of these uh, new cells, they're very cheap to produce, but they're very unstable, and the stability depends on the texture, actually, that you obtain, the homogeneity of the texture, and the, uh, the, the, um, there is out-of-plane orientations which are more stable, others that are less stable. So you want to follow how to get, which treatment you need to get the out-of-plane orientation you want. So this, uh, we're, we're still working on the improvement of that technique. So we're, uh, Today, let's say 100, 200 nanometers, we're looking into optics that can bring us to 50 or 30 nanometers, of course, sacrificing working distance at the moment. Uh, it's typically yeah, for um, strain imaging also over large areas because this is the field of view, which is maybe something like 100 times 200 micrometers. But then, of course, you can just translate your sample and stitch uh, very quickly a rather, together a rather vast field of view, right? Uh, devices, device imaging is, is very interesting with that tool as well because then you can also do things operando, which means you heat your device and you, or, or you make your device work under harsh conditions and you're, you're following what's happening. So what we're seeing here is silicon, right, but all the structure here is typically copper or other metals that strain the silicon due to differential thermal expansion. So we see usually the, uh, the presence of, of other elements or of other materials in the silicon, but we see it by means of looking at the strain in the silicon. Okay, so that's the, the full field approach, right? That sounds, of course, very nice. So we condense the beam, we diffract, and then we have this small lens, and we make an image on the detector. Just to give you an idea, this is, of course, exaggerated. We never can collect such a big angle here, right? So the, the lenses we use have typically apertures of 100 micrometers, and they're 10 centimeters away from the sample, right? So we have ridiculous apertures, and that is limiting our resolution in the full field technique, okay? So that's the Abbe limit of resolution of a microscope. Depends on the wavelength, of course, and on the collection angle here, right? So n is one uh, refractive index of air. Uh, that means the bigger the correction angle, the, the, the bigger the, the resolution, the better the resolution. And as we have a ridiculously small collection angle, resolution is poor, right? Say 100 nanometers. What we want is, of course, a much better resolution by using a much, much better lens, right? To get close to the wavelength limit. But that doesn't work today with refractive lenses and for physical reasons is, is unlikely to, to work in the near future. I have to be careful with that. But, uh, anyway. uh, but what we can do is, of course, we can do coherent diffraction imaging. Right? That's the, um, one of the holy grails right? that may, may solve a couple of problems. We can remove the lens and put in here a detector, right? suggesting that uh, 
optics is theoretically very well understood. So if we collect all rays here, we can simulate the lens with the computer and construct the image. Nobody's protesting? Okay, well, because you know the answer, right? Uh, the physics of a resolution would remain the same, right? You can say, okay, uh, the aperture is now big because big detectors is just a question of, of money, right? It's not a question of physics. Uh, yeah. Well, the problem is, of course, that what we're doing is the image, the image happens here in the image plane, right? Here, the rays just go through a lens, and uh, if you're detecting, then we're losing something, right? What we're losing is the phase, right? Because we don't know when or under which phase the photons arrive here, right? But the phase is essential for the interference that in the end, here's the image plane, right? Which is now removed because we put a detector here, right? So the interference that happens here is essential for the image, okay? The interference which means the phase is essential for the image. If we cannot detect the phase here, we don't know how to calculate the image, okay? That, that's a problem. It's a... Uh, one could justify it also quantum mechanically, right? Because the, the, the fraction limit or resolution limit of a microscope is uh, nothing else in, at the origin of the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, which means you can get a very nice resolution here, okay? As long as you don't know up to a certain delta P, right? Where your photon went through your lens, okay? If you have a big lens, then you have this angular uncertainty, which is nothing else than a momentum uncertainty of your photon. And then you can accept that you can uh, go back to a very, very small delta x here, right? But if you detect the photon, you know its momentum, so the delta x must be very big, so it, the, the information must disappear. But that's the quantum mechanical version of, of the phase problem, right? Or whatever you prefer. Uh, as the phase, we cannot recover it, we have to make sure that we know the phase beforehand or all photons have the same phase or are in phase, right? And that's the definition of a coherent beam. So we need a coherent illumination to be able, in the end, to reconstruct uh, the diffraction pattern. And of course, that's a, that's a problem, right? Because that means we'll even get less light. So if you look at the light situation, uh, if you take a five watt LED and we make a, microscope, a microscopy image and take that as a light source, we get 10 to the 19 photons per second that we can all use because we have lenses. At the SRF coherent flux is 10 to the 11 photons per second. We make 10 to the 19 photons in one year. And of course, the uh, X-ray tube flux is even more. Uh, you have to be very patient if you want to make your PhD in CDI on a tube. So uh, it's one thing. And also, it's a, it's a wasteful tool, right? Because uh, we throw away everything. Because today, it's only 0.3% of the beam that we can use right, in CDI. So how do we uh, make a coherent beam just for uh, those who have never heard about that tool, right? Uh, we first need to think about what is the coherence length of our source, okay? If we're, so this guy here is almost looking on the axis, not really, right, on this source. And if you look at waves emitted from two extreme points of this source, right, can be the sun, for example, uh, then they come almost in phase because he's almost on the axis. Then we can define, okay, how far do I have to go away from the axis before the waves are no longer really in phase. So let's say I can define they're out of phase if they're by a quarter of lambda out of phase or something like that, right? Somewhere in between uh, destructive and, uh, and constructive interference. And then, of course, I can define this geometrically just depending on the wavelength, of course, on the distance from the source and of the size of the source, okay? So the source has to be small and you need to be far away. Then you get a, a big coherence length, okay? So you can change the coherence length as it depends only on your source that and your distance. So what you do is you put a slit, okay? That's your emission from the synchrotron, that's your beam, and you put a slit uh, at the right coherence length, and then after the slit, the beam is fully coherent, which means you throw away all the incoherent part, right? And at the moment, at the RSF, that means you, you, you only use uh, one three hundredth of your beam. But that's, that's there's a, uh, a decision you have to make, right? If you, get, if you get out of it much, much more in the end, you have to do it. So, as I say, if you illuminate coherently, you may be able, you may be able to reconstruct your scattering pattern and overcome the resolution limit imposed by the optics and by the spot size. So for this, of course, once you focus your beam and you illuminate your sample and you get such a coherent Bragg diffraction pattern, if you want to inverse that, just you make a back transform, you make a Fourier transform back into real space, right? You have to know 
how it was illuminated, because it's not just a simple plane wave, right? Uh, if you calculate with a simple plane wave, you may make a mistake because you use a highly focused beam, okay? So your wavefront is curved, so that's uh, actually the, a section of the beam in the focus here, right? Of course, you have a limited size of your beam, you have a non-flat intensity, right, because you have a sharp spot, and you may have side lobes around your beam. So you have to know your beam beforehand. And uh, we have now implemented a routine tool, putting a test pattern like this uh, Siemens star test pattern here on the beam, recording the coherently scattered intensity in the forward, and we make a typographic scan that, in the end, allows us to extract the image and the beam profile. And if the image looks reasonable, we know the routine has converged, and we can use the beam profile here to stick it in and reconstruct the unknown right, of our Bragg diffraction. Typographic imaging means, uh, I don't go into depth here because that would be too long, but you take a coherent diffraction pattern, right? You scan your beam stepwise, of course, typically in a spiral, that's what we do, stepwise over your sample and take images from overlapping areas, okay? So you do not, you translate your beam less than one beam size per point. So typically you take a thousand points and just a spiral, so you have illuminated your whole sample several times with the same beam, but with a well-defined offset, and then there's routines that are now very, very stable that extract you the, the, from the coherent scattering pattern your object, which is here the, the, the Siemens star, right, and your beam. So you get your beam size and your beam shape and, and all, all the structure you may have in the beam that you need to take into account when you want to reconstruct your, your image fr from your sample. So by doing that, we can indeed extract very, very interesting information, just to show an example. So that's a coherent diffraction pattern uh, on a Bragg peak, on the OO4 Bragg peak from gallium nitride nanowires that are growing here vertically on sapphire, okay? These nanowires, uh, well, we see immediately the, by eye that they're hexagonal in, in section, right? Because we have these streaks here. Then there are some oscillations, but the oscillations are themselves structural. So they are the, the, the kind of uh, uh, hand-waving reconstruction, let's say, counting oscillations, et cetera, et cetera, becomes a bit more difficult. But of course, a computer can do it and reconstructs this hexagonal shape. So this is the electron density, right? Where we see already some disturbed regions here. And this is the phase, okay? The phase in a uh, Bragg diffraction pattern is nothing else than the atomic positions, okay? And we get a very strong phase contrast between the green field and this, uh, and this uh, violet one. And uh, the phase offset we get here corresponds to half, half a C uh, distance, right, of the lattice parameter plus eight picometers. So it's not exactly, one would expect exactly um, half on that is parameter, but our precision is much, much better than that, right? So there's some remaining strain that must offset one of these blocks. So this is a picometer precision offset, and uh, the spatial resolution is something, in this case, it's uh, roughly 10 nanometers, right? But we have the Bragg information, which is, of course, adding another information on the very precise this relative displacements of these two uh, 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 inversion domains uh, in this crystal. A very recent, uh, very beautiful result using the same technique. People were looking at gold crystals, uh, very, very small nanocrystals, single crystals that they were indenting with an AFM tip to induce one dislocation, which is quite, uh, quite nice. Huh? And uh, they managed to image the, the crystal field and thus the dislocation, because you get a, a phase jump, of course, around the dislocation. And uh, that very beautifully shows the, the, the power of this method, right? Now you could, which will be done in the second paper eventually, right? <laughs> anneal this crystal and look at the healing of this dislocation, for example, right? How it moves and, and finally heals out. So once... Uh, once we have uh, a good control of that, of course, we may get back to the origins of X-rays, let's say, or the origins of synchrotron X-rays in particular. And uh, X-rays are particularly strong in penetrating material and work with sample environments, for example, right? So operando condition, uh, gas atmospheres, whatever, that makes X-rays interesting because electrons can't go there easily, right? So we start to look at uh, now nanoparticles under different gas atmospheres uh, this is an SEM image of such a platinum nanoparticle. That's the reciprocal space map, and that's the reconstruction of the strain map of the nanoparticle. We see here extreme strain on the corners, right? Uh, and that has been already done under oxygen atmosphere. So there's already some uh, stress by the gas adsorption on that, on that particle. 
And that uh, at the moment takes many minutes, so it requires quite some stability of your whole setup, but it is possible. Okay? So now, of course, we have to work on that because with the new sources, this is going to be a real game changer because we're going to get so much more coherent flux that we can get very reasonable time resolution, uh, which also will remove some of the uh, restrictions in terms of stability. Right? Something has to be there within a few nanometers for an hour. It's much more difficult than it has to remain there for a minute. Right? So that's when we're coming to the new sources, right? Uh, a very important thing is, I, I mean, I think we all understood from Harry's talk this morning that uh, we're moving into another world, right? You're not gonna get a synchrotron which makes things two times better, so you do the same thing as today, but in half a week instead of a week, right? Uh, you will get something, uh, you get a, a totally, a completely new toy, right? So you have to think carefully what you wanna do with it, and it's not so easy to anticipate, right? Uh, the future or, or where we may get to them. I like these, uh, these uh, three examples, uh, uh, some kind of equilibrium between the, 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 the big nations in Europe, let's say. I mean, <coughs> everybody, everybody uh, has, uh, has something nice to say here, right? And, and all of them were more or less experts in their fields, right? Even, even though we would close differently today, right? Uh, they weren't stupid, right? And, and, and still, neither the inventors, that, that's quite astonishing, right? nor the deciders and nor the users, right, uh, uh, did the right thing or saw the right potential in, in their new toy. And that hasn't changed so much, I would say. So th this danger is always there, right? They, they were all living in the early 20th century and, and none of them saw the second half of the 20th century as it really became, right? But that's something uh, uh, people have pointed out quite, quite often, right? I, I like the writer Arthur Clarke and he says, of course, usually, uh, even the most daring prophecies, right, re seem very quickly ridiculous, right? If, if you look at how computers evolved and all these kind of things. So it, there's, there's a lot of examples for that. And we have to be careful to prepare very well everything that our tool is ready once we can use it, right? Because a tool is not only a synchrotron, it's also topics. It's, it's, uh, uh, we, ha we have to get the right users. We have to go in the direction of the right users. And of course, instead, in, instead of showing you a new challenge, uh, I show something that I think I've seen that graph already when I was in primary school 35 years ago, something like that. But anyway, the, um, the challenge hasn't changed so much, right? So we know there's, a, in principle, a ridiculous amount of surface of the planet required to produce, for example, everything with solar energy, right? If, if you can pay for the panels. If you look, for example, on the other hand, the wheat production well, we can take the opposite conclusion here, right? We can almost nowhere grow wheat, right? But we can get sun everywhere in the deserts. But still, as the technology of using biomass, right, is simple. We, 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 still, we still use a lot of biomass, right? Uh, Brazil produces a lot of biomass. And if you look at the, the total efficiency, you get about three kilowatt hours per square meter per year. If you would get photovoltaic, for example, efficiency, you're already a factor of 100 higher, right? You, you, you're much, much more productive than, than biomass. And in addition, you could have it floating in the ocean, right, where you, where you don't annoy, and you make no erosion <laughs> yeah, it's from agriculture. Of course, these, these are all stories, right? Why, why is it not done? All the progress here is amazing. Uh, well, because we still can't really use the electricity when we produce it somewhere in the desert, right? And of course, not only for reasons of solar power, otherwise that problem probably would never be solved, right? but also because we want to move away from fossil sources. Yeah. There is a lot of, of course, challenges now in power storage and power management in general, I right? could say it like that, which means conversion, chemical conversion, or batteries right, of power. And that opens a vast field which requires very complex systems, right? complex processes, where a lot of material science meets a lot of chemistry. And this is clearly one of the examples that I cited before, where you need some time resolution, you need spatial resolution because the th systems are too complex, right? And cannot easily be described by theory because usually there are systems which are nowhere in equilibrium, right? So this is uh, just one example. We have to think like that, okay? Even if it seems difficult, we have, of course, to move into that direction. And uh, of course, you're in this campus, you're already very good, right? You're uh, you have a, a already whole institute called the uh, Institute for Energy and Materials, right? Just call it Institute for Energy Materials, right? <laughs> this is what's going to end up with. So, so I think, uh, we, we, but we have to uh, um, anticipate the more complex experiments we will have to do with these new sources. Just a, 
an example continuing on the, on the operando, uh, we are starting with, actually I'm, I'm, I was very amused when I saw that on the, on the prospectus you got in your, in your bag, there's a, a photo from Symmetry which sells hexapods and the photo is from our beamline. I was, I was not aware of that, but it's quite, it's quite fun. Uh, so we developed on our beamline a, a small, a very small furnace that can also be used for gas atmospheres, right? It's a bit of a drawing here to heat and to make catalysis experiments under coherent diffraction imaging, which is already a challenge because you, have, you need very stable conditions and if you heat, stability is never something uh, very easy to get, right? And here's just very simple, you see here diffraction, only 2D diffraction images of a platinum uh, a nanoparticle uh, during CO uh, oxidation reaction. If you make a 2D reconstruction in real space, well, we can see by eye here something is changing. Uh, Please ignore the position uh, laterally, but the, the shape of this peak is changing and we can, re we can reconstruct kind of a strain map of the particle depending whether it's under helium, under carbon monoxide plus oxygen, or very carbon monoxide rich atmosphere. So there, there's, we are sensitive to something and we have to, to work out, right, uh, better uh, what we can extract. It's just the, the, the second example, we have uh, here uh, uh, platinum copper core shell nanoparticles before reaction and then at the fischer tropsch like reaction, which is a CO plus H2 uh, reaction, uh, of course, there's a lot of things going on here, right? So what we need is we need robust routines that allow us to reconstruct data like that, right? To, because this is post-mortem image here, which shows some results, but post-mortem doesn't show you everything, right? There is some transition in between here that we have to be able to follow, and we will be with the new sources. Now, this is when I uh, swapped to now this Outlook part, right, this was so far data we can really take today. Uh, of course, tomorrow, uh, the coherent flux will change by a factor of 30 to 100, right? So this, we will not e eventually do exactly the same, but we have to extrapolate how far can we really go, because a lot of things can be prepared, right? Of course, 10% coherent fraction, which means you don't throw away everything when you make a coherent experiment. With today's with today's uh, nano-focusing optics anyway, even if you take everything you can, you take rarely more than 10%, which means every experiment will be a coherent diffraction experiment. Just a question whether you exploit the coherence or not in your experiment. Of course, this is something uh, I was very pleased to see this morning that you're opting already for the gravity-neutral uh, geometry. ID1 was the first ESRF beamline to have a Bragg diffraction, a Bragg geometry monochromator uh, in the horizontal plane, of course, that leads uh, to polarization losses, and that's why we cannot really go in the horizontal diffraction geometry for the sample, because they will usually have very high angles. That's why we need eventually to work on vertically polarizing undulators, and uh, I'm really pleased to see that you're quite advanced in that. I'm, I'm surely uh, uh, would like to discuss a bit more with you about that. Of course, if you look further, in the, in the future, right, once the beamlines are really running, a few years will pass by eventually. So we should uh, try to think already today what else needs to be adapted, right? For example, the longitudinal coherence, if you look at really small particles, it doesn't need to be a silicon one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because uh, you will throw away intensity. So if you look at very small particles, you, will be, you, you need to adapt your coherence length to use much more flux in the end. So we have uh, done that already on ID1 with a high-resolution multilayer. Uh, horizontal geometries, of course, if you go to higher energies because we'll have more coherent flux, then that'll be less of a problem, right, because the scattering angles will be low. However, the high energies is a, maybe tempting, but there's a, I call this, this it's not really a law, right, but the coherent flux, of course, goes down with lambda to the square, right, if your brilliance is constant. Uh, detector efficiency, of course, usually doesn't get better with lambda, right, so let's say it like that. And of course, if you lo only look at one Bragg peak, which we're often doing today, right, in coherent diffraction imaging, because that's already a lot. <laughs> if you get one, you're already very lucky. Uh, uh, the integrated intensity of that Bragg peak will go down. So it's not, a, uh, not everything gets getting easier. Of course, the enabling technologies is something, detectors, we have to work on that, focusing optics, right. Uh, I think the CMOS-based detectors will come back, the indirect detectors, because just CMOS are getting so much better without us doing anything, right, because the market is somewhere else, uh, that we have, we'll have to look into that. I mean, single photon sensitivity and zero noise is not so far away. Uh, Multilayer lower lenses will be, uh, I think, something really important to, to work at. And um, I mean, all these are things we're 
typically as physicists, we very quickly look into, right, and are excited about, but uh, sometimes we're forgetting, uh, uh, if, if you write a beamline project and you need to convince funding bodies, right, and you speak about a million euro of civil engineering, that's nothing, everybody accepts that you need a million euro, right? This, actually, this is exactly where ID1 diffractometer is today, just uh, so, so we were investing, right? Uh, then you say, okay, we need lead hatches and all that. A uh, million euro is uh, still, still nothing. Sorry, I'm speaking in euro. But, uh, yeah. um, primary optics, mirrors, all that, it needs to be the best of the best, right? Diffractometer, end station, mechanical engineering. Y you, you go through these numbers and you'll be able to justify them and nobody will scream, right? But then let's say you say that, right? Because it, it needs to be a, a measurement, not an experiment. This is never going to get through, right? And, and when you go today to beam lines, then often you realize that, I mean, software-wise, there could be improvements, but we don't even dare to think how much could be improved. It's, it's once it's done, we realize how, I mean, how, how Stone Age-like did we work before. And I think it's often st strongly underestimated, and often tools are written by postdocs who should do science, right? And, and once they leave, the tools are not used anymore because nobody accepts that you have to invest uh, millions in software engineering, uh, this is, uh, to do it properly. Yeah, so this is uh, the end of, uh, of the story, of my story for today. Of course, I thank you for your attention, and here I would like to thank, of course, the ID1 team. Most of the examples are from the just operational Beamline ID1 that we built together over the last, yeah, almost five years, let's say. And of course, the XNP group, where I showed the first example from in the, uh, for the fluorescence imaging. Thank you very much. Any questions? Aldo? I would like to ask you something about uh, coherent diffraction, lens free coherent diffraction. Uh, which are the main obstacles to reach resolution approaching the atomic resolution for this experiment? Uh, if I show you the, the images here, okay? It, it's very simple, actually. It's, it's nothing else than um, numerical aperture, right? So you see these oscillations on a particle. So the further you get out in reciprocal space, okay, the better your resolution. You're ending here in a noise somewhere, right? So you need a, a big detector, of course, but often it's the, the amount of flux you have to generate intensity in the regions further out, right? And of course, if you look at here, this is a quite narrow region of around the Black Peak, right? If you look at the Q here, this is a 3.1 to 3.25 or something like that, right? Of course, if you want atomic resolution, you would need flux from zero, right, up to here. Because that's the first Black Peak, or up to the, or you need flux up to the anti Black point, right? Then you get atomic resolution. Um, there is, uh, well, first of all, if you calculate really the amount of flux you would need, then unfortunately, even with the new sources, it's going to be difficult to say it, to be optimistic. <laughs> but then there will also be a dose problem, right? Because there, uh, even if, because then of course you can say we can count very long, right? If you count long enough, you can fill reciprocal space. But there's also a dose problem. So the, the ultimate limit uh, will be the radiation damage limit of the sample. The hen there will be a Henderson limit for everything now, right? Not only for electrons. Oh, uh, Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. And uh, well, it's great for us to hear about the forefront of especially coherent fraction imaging, which is uh, speaking up a lot of uh, uh, the pace for new sources. And uh, so regarding that, uh, if we... Uh, Probably in the early days of third generation synchrotrons, even ESRF, I think uh, very few people thought that uh, coherent fraction imaging would be, would achieve so much importance in new sources. I mean, Including uh, myself. Uh, yeah, uh, well. I uh, could be part of the <laughs> cartoon I made. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's impressive that it no, it's now in the plan. So anyone that can do it is doing, trying to do better. And the, the synchrotrons that cannot do it like us are trying to build a new one to do it. So. With the new sources, of course, as you said, we probably we don't even know what we're going to do in the future, but uh, would you have a hint, for instance, so, of what are we overlooking now that would be the future of these new sources? 
we must be overlooking probably, like it was in the past for third generation synchrotrons, probably where there's some areas that are starting to grow and uh, that we, we don't foresee them now as the future. And maybe coherent diffraction imaging will be the most explored technique, but perhaps there's something we're overlooking. Well, if we don't worry about time resolution, so that otherwise we have to speak about the X-Fells, right? Uh, then eventually atomic structure in very stable materials like glasses that can take high doses, right? Maybe something. Trying to reach the atomic, atomic resolution, resolution in, in a glass, right? But it's really useful to have because sure. it's, uh, so I, I, uh, nobody there thinking about it because you, you need to go so far in the physical space. But uh, one may be able to prepare samples in a way that they're extremely stable and can be illuminated for a long time without moving. Uh, that'll be very specific samples. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, I, I rather think about the higher time resolution in this operando chemistry, the dynamics, go a little bit in the dynamics of chemical processes. Mm -hmm. Chemistry is, chemical reactions is femtoseconds, right? But chemical processes can be seconds in a, in a battery, in an industrial catalyst, uh, and, and to follow, to follow uh, an evolution, uh, swapping gases, et cetera, et cetera. So but maybe that's too close already, right? Maybe okay. I should extrapolate further, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm too much obsessed by the, by the energy topic and the batteries and the, and the dynamics uh, of, of that field. But, uh, so there's a plenty of problems to be solved already with the new techniques that uh, are waiting to be solved. Yes, yes. So in principle, what we're doing here is we're taking many, many minutes to get something. If we get it, we can at least do pseudo-static uh, things, right? You can build a batch reactor and then uh, keep your system, which is not really the process system, right? But uh, at least we could establish it in a way that we can say, okay, with a factor of 100, we can go to the process. So this is uh, uh, something that we would like to... So adding a new dimension to image yeah. plus time and plus... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So always if you think in space, spatial resolution, you will improve a little bit. You have three dimensions, right? And you want to improve a little bit of time, the effect of 100 is eaten away very quickly, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you can focus on one and, 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 and leave the others. Okay. Thank you very much again. For so it seems that uh, atomic resolution is a technical problem. Can you be more precise? <laughs> no, because uh, you need detectors that are sensitive to a very small amount of photons, and you have a high dynamics we have that. range. We have that. We have that. And then the, I in think principle, this is you can go It's technical, but it's more already only a dollar or euro problem. I think that the, the real worry is those and, of course, keeping things very stable yeah. uh, mechanically, even if the dose but is okay. If for you go quick. If you go quick, yes, but then we, at the moment, you don't have the flux for atomic resolution if you go quick, even, even with the new sources. So okay. Clear. Question? Kind of technical, but also related to, to stability, mechanical stability. Uh, you did this uh, with full field or typography? Uh, and what are the issues for doing typography with uh, BRAC typography? Uh, people are doing it. Uh, just two weeks ago, <laughs> actually, it, it seemed to have worked. It's a bit more complex because you have to have a angular, well, if you make it in 2D, it works quite well already, right? But usually if people do BRAC, they want to they wanna rock the sample, right, to have a, a, the, full, the full information in reciprocal space. And then you need to do, then you want to have some kind of 3D, 3D resolution. And at the moment, the, although in 4 volt, right, in the 4 volt scattering, the typography is extremely stable and it's a routine technique, right? It's, it's uh, uh, people press the button and do it. And the BRAC, so far the algorithms have a, still problems with the data, let's say. But in, it is getting, we have people working on, only on algorithms, so uh, there is progress, let's say. Of course, this needs to be done to not be limited by the field of view of the small beam. Uh, resolution. Resolution is much better. And, and typography will be an issue in BRAC because you, you, well, you can remain non-destructive and, and look at reasonable field of view, right? Uh, which the X-Fells cannot do, okay? They will be able to supply your coherent diffraction scattering pattern in one shot, 
but they cannot move around in the sample because it's too destructive. The atomic limit, you mean? Yeah. No, it's not really. It, it will not change resolution. It's just um, uh, at the moment, at least for the four volt people, tachography algorithms are are converging much, much better than CDI algorithms. So that's already, it's just a convergence issue that you can trust what you really reconstruct. And that your field of view is not limited to the beam size. That's, that's, the, that's the thing, right? But, but the main argument is often that tachography works in four volt, as I know, and CDI doesn't. So that's a, a whereas in, in BRAC, you find yourself pretty often with totally isolated samples, just because they are BRAC isolated, right? In, and so CDI, there's already quite good publications out, right, on, 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 on single crystallites and CDI, even in working batteries, and it's very nice uh, nature materials. When you try to study a nanocrystal, I heard that the photon packet move the nanocrystal. How to, the, uh, to solve this problem yeah. if it's not a one-shot Experiment. Yeah. It's a common problem, but that's due to electrostatic charging, right? If you have a, because peop, people typically studied what? Uh, uh, heavy metal nanocrystals. So what they did is they, they de-wetted some, some uh, heavy metal, typically gold, right? On silicon dioxide. So you have a, a, a not very well bonded interface, right? There's no epitaxial growth and you have an, uh, an isolator, right? So if you, if you uh, electrostatically charge your particle, it's going to hop away at one moment. But um, if you have, for example, uh, uh, epitaxial systems or, or, or crystallites inside a, a, a polycrystal, this is not a problem. It's, it was more a problem of these kind of artificially prepared systems to get a nice isolated nanocrystal. So, any other question? Where? A very interesting talk, and uh, I'd like uh, to have some more details about the uh, diffraction data you take. Uh, well, you scan uh, your sample and you got hundreds or even thousand diffraction patterns. How do you deal with this uh, huge amount of data? I mean, which kind of information you extract from the uh, diffraction data? Um, and then, uh, which software you use for that? I think you have developed your own software. And uh, how do you manage with th those data? Where do you uh, store them? Things like that. You mean you mean these examples here, where we do the fast scanning or yeah, USB? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because unfortunately for the Korean diffraction imaging, we don't have so much. <laughs> it's still quite slow, right? Uh, of course. Well, I don't see the same as you do. Uh, sorry. This should work. So so in this case, right, where we have this. Yeah, where we get the terabytes within hours, right? Um, we're, we're, well, the compression rate is quite high, right? But of course, for the data treatment, that doesn't help. Well, of course, you need huge amount of data storage, right? That's already a problem. But for the storage, we compress it. But then for the data treatment, you need a lot of, uh, a lot of live memory. Well, we have a, a, a cluster for that. And well, what we do is for the data treatment, I mean, yeah, you scan very quickly, you get this uh, 2D image in every pixel, then we make this sequential rocking scan, so after, after a good hour, you have a 3D reciprocal space map reconstructed by a computer in every point, of course. You can't look on every point because you've got 10,000 points in real space, and then every point you have, in every pixel you have a 3D reciprocal space map, right? But you look either at some representative maps, or you can just look at the sum of all maps, we have tools like that, right? And then you choose a region in reciprocal space where you run a fit. And the fit runs then for every pixel in real space. And then you can plot the QX, Q, the, the center of mass, or the full width of maximum. Or you, you plot the real parameters then in the end, right? You don't plot intensity, but you plot, for example, the, the Q value, so the, the length of the scattering vector. And that allows you then to extract strain and uh, lattice tilt and all that. So that's a, it is a big data thing, but once the software is written and you have a, a a big computer, it's very easy for the, it's very straightforward for the user. Yeah? So we hope one day we'll be there with the, with the CDI data as well. <laughs> and this software is available? I mean, if you have the machine yeah. and... It's open source, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We only produce open source, yeah, even for the CDI. Okay. 
Thank you, Tobias, again. Thank you.